Good morning. I convene this hearing on the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigation to review the implementation of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Our witness today uh, is Mr. Gary Cohen, the Deputy Administrator and Director of the Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Mr. Cohen, I'd like to read you two quotes from your testimony before the committee last year. On April 24, 2013, when asked by the ranking member for benchmarks to measure Sasayo's progress, you responded, and I quote, I think the keys are that we are on schedule and on track with the IT bill that we are doing, which is clearly an important part of this. And then you added, I think it is just important to take a look at each of the steps along the path and make sure that we are on track. But I'm very optimistic and confident of where we are at this point. Again, this was April 24, 2013. Here's a second quote. On September 19th, less than two weeks before the start of open enrollment, when Dr. Burgess asked you if open enrollment would be ready on October 1st, you said, consumers will be able to go online, they will be able to get a determination of what tax subsidies they are eligible for, they will be able to look at the plans that are available where they live, they will be able to see the premium net of subsidy that they would have to pay, and they will be able to choose a plan and get enrolled in coverage beginning October 1st, unquote. When pressed further, you then responded, I have nothing further to add to my answer. Now, those unqualified statements that the exchanges would be ready by October 1st are now contrasted against what we have learned through our investigations that the healthcare.gov website failed on launch. Mr. Cohen, on April 4th and 5th, 2013, just three weeks before you told this committee that you did not have any question about the exchanges being ready on October 1st, the McKinsey Company briefed you and a number of other members of the administration teams on this on a number of risks facing the website and the federal marketplace. Those included late policy, delayed designs and building time, and unlimited time to test the website. I'd like to know why did you feel confident telling the subcommittee on April 24th that everything was on track? Similarly, CMS's own emails from the summer of 2013 show that CMS officials were worried that healthcare.gov would crash on takeoff. And yet you again told us in September that everyone would be able to go online, select a plan, learn their subsidy, and enroll starting October 1st. Mr. Cohen, I thank you for being here today, and I know the number of times you have made yourself available to testify to this committee, and I do appreciate that. But it seems like you're faced with two alternatives today. Either you didn't know about the problems with healthcare.gov when you testified last year, or you did and you decided not to inform Congress. Now, this is part of a pattern for this administration and affordable care that is so disheartening to the American people, promises made and promises broken. We have spent over $600 million on the healthcare.gov website, and the administration gave absolutely no warning that a disaster was approaching, and now we know those warnings were obviously there. The broken promises don't end there. After years of saying, if you like your plan, you can keep it, the president finally apologized. And what about the $2,500 decrease in premium that the president promised? We don't hear that promise anymore. And now recent news reports have discussed narrow provider networks as a consequence of Obamacare. Will Americans still be able to keep their doctors? And now we ask, will they be able to afford their deductibles? This hearing is not just about looking backward and determining who knew about the website. But one important purpose of this hearing is accountability. So I'd like us to try and start fresh in 2014. But our ability to do so depends on you explaining fully and honestly what you knew, what you understood about the development of the exchanges and website as it was happening, and how that informed your testimony last year to this committee. Because as we have often said, this is about more than a website, that people are to trust and rely on this system and trust something so critically important to a family as their own health care. This administration needs to have an honest and open dialogue with the public about the status of the implementation. Promises of all is well just don't cut it anymore. With the start of coverage just a few weeks ago, there are many important issues to examine about how these exchanges are operating. If problems are looming, we need to get the facts on the table and do something about it before it is too late. Mr. Cohen, I hope you will give complete answers today to the following questions. Why didn't you tell Congress last year about the problems with healthcare.gov? How many people have actually paid their insurance premiums in the exchanges? Of those people who have paid their premiums, how many were uninsured and how many had their plans actually canceled? How much will the taxpayers end up spending on healthcare.gov website and where are you getting the money for it? 
News reports have stated that not enough people, not enough young people are enrolling. When will we know about the risk corridors and whether the federal and state exchanges are sustainable? So I thank you for being here today, and I yield now to the ranking member, Mr. Get, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Mr. Collin, back to this committee. Um, I think, Mr. Chairman, we could probably stipulate to the fact that healthcare.gov had a rocky start. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, what I'm sitting here thinking, the longer the Republicans keep beating the dead horse about who knew what, when, and all of that, the longer they keep raising these faux issues, like the fact that, the, that they say the website's not secure, then I think the worse it's going to be for their constituents. Because after all, isn't our desire to encourage people to sign up for health insurance if they're eligible for Medicaid, to sign up for Medicaid if they're eligible for subsidies, to get those subsidies to help pay for their insurance? As I hear my colleagues on the other side of the aisle talk about this, I can't help but wonder if they really do want their constituents to have insurance. Last week's vote on the floor was a good example where we voted on this bill that um, said that we were going to have security in healthcare.gov. Now, everybody thinks we need to have security in healthcare.gov, but the clear impression given during the floor debate and also the debate in this committee before that was that somehow healthcare.gov is not secure, when in fact there hasn't been one breach of healthcare.gov. And in the briefing we had, the federal IT people told us they haven't had any more attempts to breach healthcare.gov than any other federal government website. And of course, private websites like, for example, Target, are not exempt from that either. And so I just can't help but think that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle really don't want to have us implement this healthcare.gov or the entire Affordable Care Act in a reasonable way. They want to chill their constituents from signing up. And I think that's a darn shame. The good news is, and, and believe you me, I was one of the biggest critics on the implementation of healthcare.gov on this side of the aisle. It was rocky. It was rocky. But the good news is, it does appear now that people are beginning to enroll in this in, in a robust way. Last week, Connect for Colorado, which is our state site, announced um, the figures for my state. We're about halfway through the open enrollment period, and already 50,000 Coloradoans have signed up for private insurance on the exchange, and about 90,000 90, have enrolled in Medicare. So this is 140,000 people who didn't have health insurance before. Now, this, this represents real progress. This represents a family that doesn't have to worry about how it will pay for treatment if a child gets sick or has an accident. It represents moms who can get preventative care from breast cancer screenings to vaccines. It represents small businessmen and women who don't have to worry about losing their livelihood if they have an accident. Now, I'm proud of my governor. I'm proud of my legislature. Democrats and Republicans, and I'm proud of the leaders of Connect for Colorado for getting it up and going. I know we're not out of the woods yet. We're going to continue to have glitches, and we need to address those. But sitting around and trying to figure out what happened last fall, when everybody admits it was a disaster, does not help us towards fixing this problem in the future. I want to say one last thing. The White House released enrollment figures for all 50 states earlier this week. The national numbers mirror what happened in my state. Over 2 million people have signed up on the exchanges, and 4 million people have enrolled in Medicaid. That's 6 million people who didn't have insurance before. Um, now, minority staff released a memo this morning that showed Affordable Care Act enrollment is ahead of where the Medicare Part D enrollment was at the time that that uh, program went into effect in 2006. Right now, the Affordable Care Act enrollment is at 31 percent of projected enrollment, with half the open enrollment period to go. And at this point during Part D, enrollment had hit only 23 percent of projections. And Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent to put that memo into the record. Not objection. Thank you. So, you know, I didn't vote for Medicare Part D. Most Democrats didn't. But we worked together to try to make it a success. 
And I think that's what we should do here. One of the things I continue to be concerned about with implementation of the Affordable Care Act and the exchanges is enrollment of young people. Now, I know everybody says they'll all enroll at the end, but I'd be interested to know from the administration what we're doing to make sure we hit those targets because the exchanges are not going to work without them enrolling. And so, so in, in sum, let's work together to implement this, to get our constituents enrolled. Let's not sit around griping about what happened admittedly last year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, yields back. And now we'll recognize the Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today we are going to continue our thoughtful oversight of the President's implementation of the health care law and its effect on Americans in Michigan as well as across the country. So, Mr. Cohen, wel do we do welcome you back. Uh, you've testified before the committee a number of times, and I appreciate you returning again today. In preparing for today's hearing, we went back to review the transcripts, as you would imagine, of your testimony from last year. And when we asked what to expect at the start of the open enrollment of October, on October 1st, you assured us on two different times that uh, once in April and again in September, less than two weeks before the launch, that, yes, everything was on track. And during your more than four hours of testimony before the committee last year, there was no mention of the fact that you had been briefed twice by McKinsey in early April of last year and warned about the number of risks facing the marketplaces in the website, nor was there any elaboration on the fact that CMS employees were well aware that the website build was riddled with problems far behind schedule with the October 1 launch in jeopardy. So the purpose of today's hearing is not to rehash every detail of the failed launch. But to move forward, we've got to understand what you knew about the status of the website and implementation of the President's law at the time that you appeared before the committee. Looked us in the eye and said, of course, everything was on track. It's time to be candid and transparent with Congress uh, and the American public. Lots of promises have been made. Many have already been broken. What's next? The only way the public can trust the health care system and the administration that is implementing the law is if the administration officials are open and transparent about the facts and what the American people should expect from the law and for their health care moving forward. Providing facts and specifics is an important first step towards restoring the credibility that we all want. American people deserve the peace of mind that there will be no more surprises. The information available is the entire and true story. And I know that you'll try to help us uh, understand what happened and provide some answers. And I yield the balance of my time to the Vice Chair, Dr. Burgess. I, I thank the Chairman for yielding. And, and Mr. Cohen, I too want to welcome you back to the committee. And I appreciate your, the time that you devote to our oversight efforts. But here's the central question. How in the world can we expect people across this country to trust this administration when they've been continually told that everything will be ready, and in fact it was not. It's pretty clear now that the administration knew far more about the concerns prior to the launch of healthcare.gov before October 1st, and yet you came before us on September 19th, and each time you came to this committee in the past year, you promised that healthcare.gov would be functional October 1st. If I recall your recitation correctly, there were no contingency plans because none were necessary. You insisted to subcommittee members less than three weeks before the launch of the federal exchange that everything was on track. I'll stipulate that some parts of healthcare.gov may be working now, but they're only working now because a glitch czar had to be appointed after the launch of healthcare.gov. I don't know how you feel about that, but it upsets me that you came before this committee and told us everything was okay. We spent hundreds of millions of dollars. You had well over three and a half years to get it right. And then we've got to appoint a glitch czar to sort things out so that people can actually enroll on healthcare.gov. The enrollment numbers, I think, are meager. Perhaps you have a different story, and you'll share that with us. But errors, canceled plans, and broken promises, those are just the start. And now we know that your agency, Health and Human Services and the White House failed to ex heed internal warnings about the lack of readiness of the exchanges. It is my hope today that you came to this subcommittee prepared to answer our questions. I hope you will set the talking points aside. You owe this to your superiors at HHS. You owe this to the Secretary. You owe this to the President. You owe it to the Congress 
and most importantly, you owe it to the American people. This committee is about oversight. Yes, that requires that we look in the past. Yes, that requires that we look to the future. I think the problems of the past dictate to us that there are going to be significant problems during this first year of healthcare.gov, and you need to be prepared to work with this committee to mitigate the damage that is going to be visited on America's health care system and the American people. And Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back my time. Chairman yields back. Now recognize uh, Ms. Castor for five minutes. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, everyone. Mr. Chairman, this is our first hearing of the year uh, on the Affordable Care Act. Uh, last year, in the subcommittee, in the health subcommittee, and the full committee, the majority held 12 hearings on the Affordable Care Act. Uh, these, the hearings last year often were frustrating because they were not held uh, necessarily to examine exactly what the law is doing or to work in a bipartisan fashion to improve the law. They were part of an effort to criticize the Affordable Care Act, spread misinformation, and build support for repeal of the Affordable Care Act. The majority's unrelenting focus on repealing the Affordable Care Act is one of the reasons, I believe, why this Congress has been one of the most least productive in the history of our country. But fortunately, we're at a different place today. As of today, approximately 10 million Americans have coverage because of the Affordable Care Act. Over 2 million have coverage through private plans sold through the marketplaces. More than 4 million have enrolled <clears throat> in Medicaid and now have access to a doctor or health services that they did not have before. More than three million young, adult, young adults aged 26 and under have coverage through their parents' plans. And millions more have coverage purchased directly from an insurer. Now, as uh, the ranking member, DeGette, explained, the rollout of healthcare.gov was anything but smooth. And I uh, directly expressed my displeasure to President Obama and Secretary Sebelius. Uh, people were relying on us. And uh, moving forward, I know there will still be hurdles to overcome over the next few months. But the law is working. Members who want to repeal the Affordable Care Act will have to explain to these 10 million Americans why they should lose their coverage and their new rights and their protections. And coming from the state of Florida, they're going to have to explain to my older neighbors, our parents and grandparents, why they want to take away uh, the improvements in Medicare, closing of the donut hole, uh, the new preventative care and wellness visits that are available, uh, and the fact that we made Medicare stronger. The members will have to explain to the 129 million Americans with pre-existing conditions why they do not deserve the same access to health coverage as everyone else. They will have to explain to American women why they want to go back to a world where they could be charged more for the same coverage as a man. And they will have to explain to people who work in blue-collar jobs why they should face higher premiums. And they'll have to explain to the millions of Americans getting coverage for the first time why they would be better off uninsured. I do not think my Republican colleagues will be able to make this case. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Republican critics of the law were also incorrect about many things. They, but they were right about one major fact, that once the Affordable Care Act went into effect, there would be no turning back. This law is in effect, and it will, be, it will continue to become a part of the fabric of this nation. It will lift millions of American families, provide economic security. The Civil Rights Act, the Social Security Act, the original Medicare legislation, all land, landmark laws were enormously contentious in their time. Republican opponents predicted they would put this nation on the path to ruin. They said the nation was not ready for the changes that were coming. They said the new rights and protections the law guarantees, the laws guaranteed for our fellow Americans were not important. And now we cannot imagine our country without a basic safety net for our seniors or equal rights for all of our citizens. In the years ahead, all the hyperventilating about broken websites and enrollment trajectories and demographic mix will quickly be forgotten. Instead, we will look back and wonder how we ever had a health system that spent double what every other nation spends per capita while leaving 50 million uninsured and allowing rampant discrimination against the people who needed the coverage most. I hope this hearing will be the start of a productive and cooperative session of Congress, 
And I hope we can start to work together on the ACA, rather than spending another year in a never-ending campaign against a law that is doing enormous good for the American people. I yield back. Thank you. Gentlelady yields back. So I would now like to introduce the witness for today's hearing. Gary Cohen is the Deputy Administrator and Director of the Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. He has served as General Counsel for the California Health Benefit Exchange and has served as the Director of the Division of Insurance Oversight in CECIO for two years prior to becoming the Deputy Administrator and Director of CECIO. And I will now swear in the witness. Um, Mr. Cohen, you're aware that the current committee is holding an investigative hearing, and when doing so, you have the, we have the practice of taking testimony under oath. Do you have any objection to testify under oath? I, I thank you. Chair, I advise you, you're under the rules of the House. You're entitled to be advised by counsel. Do you, be, uh, do you, desire, to be, do you desire to be advised by counsel? In that case, uh, we'll swear you in. Um, do you swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? You are now under oath and subject to the penalties set forth in Title 18, Section 1001 of the United States Code. You may now give a five-minute uh, summary of your written statement, Mr. Cohen. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Murphy, Ranking Member DeGette, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to update you on the Affordable Care Act and health insurance marketplaces and to talk about the millions of Americans who, many for the first time, are able to purchase high-quality, affordable health coverage. When I appeared before this subcommittee shortly before the beginning of enrollment, I said that while we may encounter some bumps when open enrollment began, we would solve them. Clearly. The problems we encountered in October were far worse than I or any of us anticipated. Simply put, the system did not work nearly as well as it should have or that, uh, or that we expected that it would. This wasn't a time to get discouraged. It wasn't a time to give up. It was a time to roll up our sleeves and get to work and solve the problems. And that's what we did. Since that time, we have fixed healthcare.gov piece by piece in a prioritized metrics-driven manner. The tech team fixed the site's software and enhanced the site's hardware to improve its capacity, speed, and stability. By the end of November, healthcare.gov was able to support more than 800,000 consumer visits per day with a response time of less than one second and an error rate well below 1%. Consumers have responded overwhelmingly to the improved site. Enrollments in the federal marketplace in December alone represent a seven-fold increase over October and November combined. By the end of December, nearly 2.2 million people had selected plans from the state and federal marketplaces. Sometimes we lose sight when we talk about numbers that are this big, that these enrollments are more than just numbers. They are individual people, many of whom have not been able to obtain needed care or had the peace of mind that comes from having health coverage for years. For example, Nathan Aldridge, a cancer survivor from Virginia, now has a plan without having to worry about paying more because of his pre-existing condition. He had been paying for a plan with a $483 monthly premium and a $5,000 deductible. Now he has a plan with a $111 monthly premium and a $1,750 deductible. Emily Wright, a university student in Tennessee, enrolled through the federal exchange, qualify a federal subsidy, and picked a top-tier plan that will cost her only $125 a month. She's been able to get an appointment with an obstetrics gynecology practice the first step before needed surgery. We hear stories like theirs every day. Because of the Affordable Care Act, Americans like Nathan and Emily can be confident that the plans offered in the marketplace are high quality and affordable. The Affordable Care Act standardizes certain essential benefits which insurers must offer. These include basics like doctor's visits, hospitalizations, prescription drugs, and maternity and newborn care. Marketplace plans are designed so that consumers can compare plans with similar levels of coverage and make more informed decisions. Insurers are now prohibited from charging higher premiums to enrollees because of their health problems and from charging women more than men, making pricing more fair. At the same time, premium tax credits and cost-sharing reductions are helping consumers pay for their health care coverage. Of the nearly 2.2 million marketplace signups so far, nearly 80% of those consumers are receiving financial assistance. Insurers can no longer refuse to accept consumers because of a pre-existing health condition. With limited exceptions, plans are required to enroll individuals regardless of health status, age, gender, or other factors. Finally, insurance coverage is there when people most need it because plans can no longer impose annual or lifetime dollar limits on essential health benefits. 
Americans no longer have to worry about hitting a prohibitive dollar amount which could force a consumer into bankruptcy or cause them to have to forego necessary care. The health insurance market in 2014 looks dramatically different than it did in the years before the Affordable Care Act. Now, as with any change this major, there's bound to be some disruption. So to ease the transition to the new market, CMS is working closely with insurers, consumers, and other key stakeholders who are working together to ensure that consumers have coverage and receive needed medical care. In December, CMS announced a number of steps to help consumers, including requiring insurers to accept payment through December 31st of 2013 for coverage beginning January 1, and giving consumers additional days to sign up for marketplace coverage. Insurers have also stepped up, with many agreeing to voluntarily extend the deadline for consumers to pay their first month's premium. And many pharmacies announced plans to ensure a smooth transition by providing consumers with, tra with transitional supplies of prescriptions. I continue to believe what I said in September. The ultimate story of the Affordable Care Act will not be what happened in the early days that the website went live, or even in the first days of January as people use their new coverage. The lasting legacy will be people like Nathan and Emily who will be able to get the health care they need and have the security of knowing they will be able to pay for it because of the changes made by the law. Thank you, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, the chairman now recognizes himself for five minutes. Mr. Cohen, you testified several times for this committee that HHS would be ready by October 1. <clears throat> Can you tell us why you were wrong on that? When I testified, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, you know, both you, you referred to April and, and in September, and each time uh, I gave you the best information that I had and gave you truthful testimony based on the information that I had available to me. Um, mm -hmm. It turned out that uh, uh, the problems that we faced when the website went live were, uh, as I've said and as everyone knows, you know, just dramatically different and bigger than, than I think what any of us, test uh, what any of us expected. Um, as to why... Uh, uh, we didn't uh, anticipate what was going to happen when we went uh, live. You know, I, I'm not sure I know all the answers. I think, you know, some of the people who are responsible for designing and building the website might be able to give you better answers. I know initially uh, we were overwhelmed by the volume of people who came in, but as time went by, that was clearly not the sole source of the problem. There were other problems as well. Well, let me go with this. But you were there for the briefings and the McKenzie report, which uh, we uh, discussed in this uh, subcommittee of the disaster that they talked about to a number of people within the administration. So you had that information, but you also said you were told something otherwise. So who told you otherwise that things would be fine? So may I speak for a moment to McKinsey? I mean, I, I absolutely attended briefings of the work that the McKinsey folks did. And there's no question that they identified a number of risks that they saw back in April for, you know, whether we would be successful uh, come October. At no time did the McKinsey people say to us, you're, you're not going to make it or you're not going to be successful. They identified a series of risks and they identified some steps that they recommended we take in order to mitigate those risks and increase the likelihood that we would be successful. Uh, and I think we did those things. Uh, and I think that a number of the concerns that McKinsey expressed, for example, whether the hub would be working or whether some of the larger states like New York and California would succeed, did not prove to be a problem. The hub has worked very well. New York and California have done very well. Um, so I think we took very much to heart uh, what the McKinsey people recommended uh, that we do, uh, and we proceeded forward uh, and, and tried to, you know, do the best we could to maximize the likelihood that we would be successful. But, again, we've looked at the McKinsey report. It was not subtle. It was strongly worded in terms of there were serious problems, but in that same month you came before us and said things were fine. So who on your staff told you that things were going to be okay? Who informed you specifically? I, I received uh, regular briefings from uh, the various parts of CMS uh, that were responsible for that? overseeing the the, uh, the the website build. Uh, the the person that we I heard from the most um, probably was Henry Chow. And Henry Chow told you that despite the briefing from McKenzie, that things would be okay. Henry Chow gave you know we had regular reports on the status of the build. Um, and certainly when I came here in September, uh, the testimony that I gave was based on uh, briefings that I had from Mr. Chow and others as to what the capability of the site would be. Did you share with Mr. Chow the, the McKenzie briefing? 
I don't know whether he saw the briefing itself. I, Did I you discuss the contents of that with him? I think we talked about uh, the issues that were raised in the briefing, yes. See, I'm puzzled because when Mr. Chow was here speaking under oath, he said he didn't know anything about it. I'm, I'm, that's why I say I don't know that we told him or that he saw the report itself or that he was, but we talked about the issues. So let me ask were, this. I mean, it, it was significant enough that the secretary said that she hired McKenzie to give them a briefing uh, and look at this analysis. Very important. Uh, significant problems were identified. Uh, they were not small. But now we're not sure whether or not the key person who was advising you of this was even told about this report to identify and what to do about the major problems. So there's something pretty inconsistent here. Well, I, I think that we adopted a number of the recommendations that McKinsey uh, had for us and uh, put into place uh, a number of the things that McKinsey recommended that we do in order to uh, um, well, here, increase here, the likelihood of a success, and that's what I mean. When, I mean, those things happen. So Mr. Chow was aware of the things. Well, I, I need to know what specifically. If you go to the doctor, and the doctor says, "Can you tell me what your specific symptoms and problems are?" If you don't tell the doctor what your problems are, they can't probably diagnose and treat. So, what specifically did you tell Mr. Chow, and what specifically then did he do in response to that? I, I, I'm not going to be able to recall or tell you exactly what we told Mr. Chow. What I can tell you is that there were recommendations, for example, in, uh, in the report with respect to how we should be organized uh, and some changes that they recommended that we make in terms of how the process was managed that we, we implemented as a result of the report. Thank you. Recognize Mr. Get for five minutes. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. This hearing today, I just noticed this after my opening statement, is called 2014 Seeking PPACA Answers. So I'd, I'd really like to ask you, Mr. Cohen, um, some questions about where we go from here. As, as you acknowledged in your opening statement and your written statement, um, the problems with healthcare.gov were far greater than ones you anticipated before October 1st. And we're all now well, well aware of the administration's efforts to fix the problems. I'm wondering if you can tell me as we sit here today, January 16th, what problems do you still see with the federal website and what um, steps is the administration taking to remedy them? Uh, thank you. Uh, we continue to address uh, specific issues uh, with respect to the way that the site is functioning, uh, and the, that effort has not flagged at all. I mean, it, it's ongoing. So uh, as we continue to identify uh, any uh, aspects in the way that the system isn't performing as properly as it, as it should, whether those be design and architecture or whether those be software, you know, sort of coding types of problems that we're not, you know, getting the right result, uh, we continue to address uh, a lot of those issues. The major one that we're dealing with right now, uh, I would say in terms of big picture, has to do with um, the financial management, making sure that the uh, plans are getting paid. We're using a mitigation, mitigating process right now because we don't have full functionality for that particular process that we're working toward putting that in place. As, yeah, as we heard in November and December, the administration was focusing first on getting people enrolled, and then they were worrying about the back end. So, so with that back end, uh, what kind of problems are we still seeing, and what, what are you doing to try to remedy well, that? Right now, I mean, pay, payments will be going out next week for the first time uh, of, uh, of um, uh, uh, advanced premium tax credits to, to issuers, uh, but we're using a process where they're providing us with uh, the data uh, from the issuers based on their records as opposed to being able to use the records that are generated by the, the FFM. And that more automated process will be going into place in the next months. And, and uh, is, are you working, is the administration working with the insurers to make that happen? Yes, absolutely. And we've actually had tremendous uh, responsiveness from the insurers, and they've told us that they're very pleased with the way that process is going. It's not ideal, but it's, it, it will work okay. to get them paid. Mr. Chairman, I think that would be a good follow-up hearing to bring the insurers in and see how that's working, just FYI. Um, let, let me ask you, Mr. Cohen, we've all heard about the um, number of people who have signed up both on the state exchanges in the states like mine that have state exchanges and also healthcare.gov. Um, what, what's your 
opinion about the number of people who have signed up and also the age mix? So in terms of the number of people who signed up, obviously there's no question that we got off to a slower start than we would have liked and that, than, than, than we hoped. But we had tremendous uh, response in December, and we're continuing to see very good numbers as we go into January. Um, I think uh, the, in terms of the total, if we're able to maintain the pace that we're at now and if we see another you know, sort of uptick towards the end of March, as everyone expects, because that's the deadline for the end of open enrollment, we still have almost three months to go. So I think we're very uh, encouraged by the enrollments that we're seeing now. There clearly is tremendous demand for this product. We saw that from the beginning. But there's also, I, I will say, though, that enroll because of the glitches with the website in the early days, the enrollment has been lower than the administration had projected, correct? That's true. And what about enrollment of younger people? So, uh, you know, we're actually quite encouraged by the response that we've gotten from younger people. Uh, the, the percentage of younger people that we uh, uh, reported uh, this uh, uh, week uh, is actually comparable to the percent of the of that age group in the general population. So I, I think that's looking good. And I if you could just, if, I'm sorry, if you can just briefly tell me what the administration is doing to bump those numbers back up between now and the, uh, in the end of March, both for the general population and also for the younger enrollees. Absolutely. So you know, I think you're going to see a uh, an even a stepped up media campaign, uh, obviously uh, we as well as the health insurance companies held back a little bit in the beginning because the site wasn't working well, but now that it is, I think we'll see uh, a, a significant increase in that. It's going to be very much targeted at the younger audience, so uh, we have a, a Magic Johnson ad that's coming out now. We're going to be uh, advertising during the Olympics. We're, you know, we're trying to, to advertise in ways that will definitely, and through social media as well, ways that are definitely targeted toward that younger uh, group. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mayor. You may want to talk to Jimmy Kimmel because he's not saying good things about this. We can also have ads during the Super Bowl because I know that'll appeal to the Colorado voters. That'll be costly. <laughs> there you go. Uh, now recognize Dr. Burgess for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cohen, you know I'm going to bring this up. So I've got to do it. Need to have you address it. September 19th, 2013, I asked you a yes or no question. Will the enrollment process be ready October 1 of this year? I'll remind you of your answer. You said consumers will be able to go online. They will be able to get a determination of what tax subsidies they are eligible for. They will be able to look at the plans that are available where they live. They will be able to see the premium net of subsidy that they would have to pay, and they will be able to choose a plan and get enrolled in coverage beginning October 1st. Do you recall that exchange, sir? I recall it very well. Knowing what you know now, would you like to revise that answer in any way? Well, clearly it was wrong, but it was also what I believed and what I understood I, I based, right. on, based on what I had been told. I, I, I'd like to answer your question, if you would permit me. Um, I knew that I was going to be asked that question, obviously, when I came here on September 19th, and I knew that it was very close to October 1st. And I was very careful to get a thorough briefing from the people who were responsible for overseeing the, the, the build of the website. And the answer that I gave you was exactly what they told me our functionality would be on October 1st. Exactly. Who, who told you that exactly? Mr. Chow was in the briefing, among others. Well, look, you know, I just got to tell you this, and you've heard me say it before, and I'll continue to say it in the future. I simply do not understand why no one has been held accountable for an error that egregious. If I were you, I would fire someone under me, and it would have happened in October. If I were the secretary, I would have fired you, and that would have happened in October. And if I were the president, I would be so mortified and embarrassed by what has been the disaster of my signature piece of legislation signed into law, I would fire the whole lot of you. Now, that was an attack not but taken, if, if but I don't happened... understand why we are expect why do we why should we believe you now when nothing you said over the past year, year and a half has been accurate. Because you the site is working, in, Congressman. The because site, the site is working. That's why you should believe I would now. Submit and if we had all been it fired, it would not be working. working. Because it has not been built on the back end. Provider payments are not flowing. The subsidies that are supposed to go to the insurance companies, they tell me, are coming as a result of a paper process that's having to be entered by hand. This thing is a disaster. And the providers are going to be the ones who take it on the chin because we are obligated to see those patients when they show up. 
No one can verify benefits at 3 o'clock in the morning. You take care of the problem. After the fact, who pays the bill? The secretary said she would not be responsible for paying those bills. So I ask you, doctors and hospitals around this country are asking you, who is responsible for paying those bills? The you haven't built the, the back end of company, your website The insurance yet. company that, is, uh, that is in, has enrolled a person is responsible for paying those bills, and the payments of tax credits and cost-sharing reductions to those insurance companies will be flowing next week. They will begin next week. That's and I would happen. submit to you that part of the website has not yet been built, and that is going by hand. It is a painfully slow process. I've been told numbers as low as 5 to 10 percent of those payments are going through. I would appreciate if you have additional information that you will make it available to the committee. I hope we will have an opportunity to discuss that in the future. Absolutely. Because it does concern me a lot. I think our providers are the ones who are truly at risk from your mismanagement of this problem. Now, there is a something that's receiving a lot of attention right now. It's the concept of, of risk corridors and risk adjustment. Are you aware of that? Yes. Um, the risk corridor program does not contain specific, uh, specific appropriation in law. So are you going to be seeking an appropriation for the risk corridor language in the law? I, I'm, I'm going to have to refer you to the Office of Management and Budget with respect to those issues. Would to, you be willing to share with us the ongoing discussions that are happening between you and OMB on, on that? Are there emails? Are there memos? Are there, are there, is there information you can make available to the committee? I, I will certainly take that request back. It appears to a lot of us that you are going to be needing and sending taxpayer dollars in order to handle this problem of the risk corridors. Can you assure the committee today that that will not be happening, that this risk adjustment will be done from within the balances available in the Affordable Care Act and those uh, amounts that you're collecting from insurance companies and not come from the taxpayer? I, I, I think... I don't have an answer for you today. I understand it's an issue. We're working with OMB, and I'll certainly, uh, you know, wor work with you and understand that it's an important issue that you, you know, are entitled to, to know about. If you have a legal memorandum that has been prepared for you or your department, will you share that with the committee? Uh, uh, that's not a decision I get to make, but I will certainly take your request back. I haven't seen such a memorandum myself, no. You have not? Not at this point, no. Do you anticipate seeing one? I, I don't know the answer to that. This committee needs that memo, and I want you to re take that request back with you. Um, again, we'll have an opportunity to talk again, I believe. Thank I you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cohen, I want to give you an opportunity to answer one of Dr. Burgess's question. Has the part of the website dealing with payments been built, or is it yet to be built? The automated process for payments is still being built, but we have a process in place that is working and payments will be going out next yeah, week. You have an anticipated date of when it's going to be built? I, I don't have an answer to that uh, as I sit here, no. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, could we have him supplement that when he finds out when it will be built? Yes, we'd like Thank to know you. that. Uh, Ms. Cash, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Cohen. You know, the, the headline uh, back home in Florida this week was um, <clears throat> Florida enrollment surges under healthcare.gov. During October and November, due to the problems with the website, we only had 18,000 Floridians sign up for coverage. But in December, we had 140,000 Floridians sign up for coverage. Uh, Florida continues to lead the nation in enrollment among the three dozen states that are using the federal marketplace. So this is good news. In fact, um, on Monday in Tampa, uh, the mayor of Tampa, Bob Buckhorn, had a great announcement, and this is something that other members of Congress can, uh, can use and work on with their elected officials. Mayor Buckhorn announced that all of the parks and recreation centers in the city of Tampa would be available to uh, host navigators and, and uh, assisters sign up, many of our neighbors, for coverage. I think this is a very creative move. Uh, Secretary Sebelius gave him a pat on the back as well. We've got to make it easy for folks to sign up. And one of the things that is, um, I guess, a good problem to have is we have such a competitive marketplace in the Tampa Bay area. We have over 100 private insurance plans that people can uh, examine and see what works best for them. But, you know, that can be a little daunting for, for folks as well if they just go on to... I guess there are people that can go on to healthcare.gov and figure it out and, and analyze it and determine what works best for them. But there are many, many people all across the country that need to, to
to sit down and work with a real person and sort through those options, understand what the tax credits do. In Florida, two-thirds of those who are eligible for uh, coverage will be eligible for uh, the ta tax credits. Already, over 80% of the people who have signed up have used those tax credits. What can we do to get more help out on the ground to, to help people understand the option? So thank you, uh, Congresswoman. I think it's very important, as you say, to get support from uh, state and local uh, officials, from congressional offices, uh, to, to help get the word out, to, to, to direct people to uh, assisters who can help them. There is a find local help uh, section of healthcare.gov where people can say, you know, what what area they're in and get the a list of the but many people if they don't have a computer if they're not they don't even know about that uh, right how, so how for, are you going to how are we going to reach them for the people who don't have a computer uh obviously the the effort really has to be to bring them in uh to a a location where you know a navigator is working or a uh, 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 uh you know other assisters are available to help them through the process um and uh i think you know, the more assistance that we can get from uh, people in the community who, who, who know these folks rather than, you know, just coming from the federal government is a big help. Yeah, our community health centers have been very active, churches. Uh, it's really a community-wide effort. <clears throat> uh, but uh, I appreciated that you said, uh, talking about the millions of folks who have signed up, that they're, these are not just numbers, these are real people. And really, one of the biggest obstacles uh, right now for many of our neighbors to uh, to realize health care coverage is what Republican governors and state legislators have done in blocking the Medicaid expansion. For example, in the state of Florida, we have almost one million Floridians who uh, are caught, are being blocked, the access to the doctor's office is being blocked just because they won't accept the $50 billion available to the state of Florida over the next 10 years. That's our tax money. We want that tax money back to work for our neighbors to, to help our families get to the doctor's office, create jobs, help our hospitals. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think we need an oversight hearing on the these states that have blocked Medicaid expansion and what that's going to do to the health care marketplace. Uh, Mr. Cohn, what, what's uh, HHS's plan to, to continue to, to work with states uh, on this issue? We certainly, uh, you know, encourage every state to uh, take up the Medicaid expansion. Uh, it's a great deal for the state. It's a great deal for the people in the state. Uh, it's a great deal for providers in the state who will have, uh, you know, uh, see a decrease in uncompensated care, uh, a tax that falls on all of us. Um, and uh, we have been working uh, as creatively as we can with different states to come up with different ways of doing this. Some states have some different approaches that they wanted to take that we've been working with them on. So we, so we continue to work with all the states and, and hope that more will, will take up the uh, expansion. Thank you very much. The only you'll use back uh, now are the vice chair of the full committee, Ms. Blackburn, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cohen, you just said that your testimony to Mr. Burgess on September 19th was incorrect and you had based it on staff reports. Am I correct in that? I said it turned out to be wrong. It turned out to be wrong. turned out okay. to be wrong. <laughs> Let me ask you this then. If you're basing your testimony today on staff reports, how do we know that this is correct? Uh, I, I think that there has been an intense uh, focus since October Are you, on... Have you changed your process of due diligence? Are you vetting? Are you questioning? I think we are receiving more and more thorough uh, briefings at the leadership How do you know level. that? If what you told us in September 19th was wrong, how do you know that what you're telling us right now is well, correct? You know, ultimately, I have to rely on the people who work for me. I, I don't... You didn't fire anybody then. Are you watching them more closely now? <clears throat> I think we were having we are having regular and very detailed briefings on, okay. and we also we also brought in uh, a you know what we sort of call the general contractor, the QSSI company that was an existing contractor. You on the want project. to quantify those That's, briefings for us as you submit things about the website and when it's going to be due? Why don't you let us know what what briefings you are having? Also, I want to ask you one thing real fast. You said the website is fixed. Can you define fixed? 
I think the website is fixed in the sense that uh, we no longer are having problems uh, that we had creating accounts in the beginning. The response so of the site. it's not 100% percent operational. It is a qualified fix. That's true. <clears throat> okay. So it is uh, fixed is an amoeba. And that's going to change as you come back to us. So let me move on. You had three promises in Obamacare. It was built on three promises. It was going to save families $2,500 a year. And the second two promises, one, if you like your plan, you can keep it. And if you like your doctor, you can keep it. So let me ask you this. Since the president promised that the average family would reap a premium decrease of $2,400 a year under the law, has that happened? Well, I'm not sure that's what the president said. Yes or no? Um, I, oh, yes, I, he did say it. I, I'm not sure that's what the president said. Uh, yes, sir, he I, did many, say that. Many Americans are able to obtain better coverage for at lower cost than they were Mr. before Cohen, the Affordable Care Act. Mr. Cohen, that is not what the president said, and I ask for a yes or no answer. Let me move on. The president said if you like your plan, you can keep it. Has he kept that promise? Um, the law permitted uh, insurance companies to maintain uh, grandfathered plans in effect. Uh, that was their decision whether to continue with those plans or to uh, change No, sir, them. that was not the promise. So, the president what? even apologized for this, and he offered some enforcement relief so that these peoples could keep the plans I they was, liked. Is that I, correct? I was about to say that okay. um, as it, it, not all Americans were able to keep their plans because of okay. the decisions that uh, the, the industry had made, and so we, we announced uh, uh, a transitional policy that enabled more of those okay. plans to stay How in long effect. will that transitional process last? A year? Two years? As of now, Forever? what we've announced so far is it's for a year. You know, a lot of those people couldn't keep their plans, and you talked about an Emily from Tennessee. Let me tell you about another Emily from Tennessee. Emily lives in Pulaski. Emily had coverage because Emily has lupus. And guess what? Under Obamacare, her plan was canceled. Emily doesn't have health insurance right now. She's having a tough time getting it under Obamacare. I'm having her in as my guest for the State of the Union. Maybe you can help Emily work this out, Mr. Cohen, because your promises that were made by you and this administration have not been kept, and then you want to give us a qualified definition of fixed, and you are still depending on your staff, so you all are just running in circles and you cannot give us definitive answers. So let me ask you this. Emily in Pulaski, she had a doctor she liked. Is she going to be able to keep that doctor even though she has no insurance and because of Obamacare, her insurance was canceled and she is trying to be treated for lupus and work 40 hours a week? Uh, you know, if you will uh, get us information about if Emily's willing, you know, interested in talking to somebody from CMS to, who can help her uh, understand what her options are. She and what may is, be available. I appreciate we'd that be, very we'd much. We'd be happy to do that. We're doing because that Because she is a classic victim of what has happened when the federal government stepped in and said, all these plans that you have that work for you, that fit for you, we're not going to let you keep them because we, the federal government, think we know better how you, Emily, can handle your lupus. Now, that is what you have done to the American people. And when you come in here, you give us misinformation. And then when we ask you a question, you cannot be specific. Mr. Cohen, I agree with Dr. Burgess. You ought to be fired. The only this time has expired, I recognize now the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welsh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Cohen, uh, there's a lot of things in the Affordable Care Act, uh, but many of those provisions are about consumer protections to ensure that uh, Americans do have a diverse choice of health care providers. Um, but as with many new Goodbye. laws, there's some uh, wrinkles in the implementation and some disagreement between a debate about uh, congressional intent, and I wanted to ask you about one of those with respect to the ACA. I've been hearing from some providers, and I know some of my colleagues have been hearing the same concerns about the interpretation of the provider non-discrimination provision uh, in Section 2706 of the Public uh, Health Service Act, uh, and specifically what some of these providers are telling me is that uh, your agency's sub-regulatory guidance, in their view, 
in the view of many uh, legislators, is inconsistent with the statute and legislative intent. And the concern is this, that the guidance could lead, in fact, to discrimination against some providers by health insurers, which this provision was designed to prevent. Uh, are you aware of these concerns? And my question is, what are your plans to address them and to ensure that the statute is implemented uh, as intended? So thank you, Congressman. And yes, I am aware of those concerns. I have had meetings with uh, a number of provider uh, groups who ex have expressed the concern that, that uh, you've raised. Um, uh, frankly, it's been a while since we looked at that issue. So uh, what I would ask is that um, we could have folks, you know, t talk to you and your staff and, 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 and move forward to, to understanding what the concerns are and seeing whether there's something we can do to clarify the guidance so that, it, um, so that we make sure that there isn't discrimination, which clearly is what the law. Well, that would be helpful. And I, there may be some colleagues on the other side of the aisle as well <clears throat> who are hearing some of these concerns. So uh, I would welcome the opportunity to follow up with your agency and, and try to work this out uh, to make certain that we stay on that intent that there not be discrimination. We'd be happy to do that. Providers. Thank you. And just a couple of things. You know, uh, it, it, one of my concerns from the very beginning is we've got to get health care costs down. I don't care how we pay for it, whether it's employer-based, taxpayer-based, individual-based. If the cost is going up a lot faster than wages, profit, and growth, we're just not going to have a sustainable and affordable system. <clears throat> and what we're learning now is that Medicare spending is growing slower than the inflation rate. This is recently, and that's a welcome development, that the program spent only 7 tenths percent 0.7 percent more per beneficiary in 2012 than in 2011. Five years ago, that annual increase was 5.4 percent. Also, just in overall global health care spending, uh, the rate of increase is slowed. Uh, it was 3.7 percent in 2012, less than half of the growth rate a year ago. Two questions. One, do you attribute any of this to uh, the law? Uh, and number two, what are the implications for the deficit uh, over a 10, 20 year period? So I, I think that the law does contain a number of provisions that are, uh, 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 that are attacking the, the question of health care costs. Um, I think that that's an issue that we need to continue to work on. And I think that the law does give us some tools to continue to do that. I look forward to uh, using our... Um, process of certifying uh, uh, qualified health plans going forward. We were, we were quite liberal, I guess is the word I would use. We sort of took them all, you know, the first year to get the market up and running. But I think going forward, we can at least look at uh, what we can do to uh, encourage uh, health insurance companies to work to keep uh, costs down. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, we know that uh, the health expense is a huge part of the American economy and of the federal government's spend. So uh, as we are able to uh, attack that problem, uh, it will have a very positive impact on, uh, on spending and the deficit going forward. Chairman Yon, it's back now. Recognize Dr. Gingrey for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Cohen, thank you for being with us once again. Uh, I asked you the last time uh, you were here whether you had concerns uh, that young people would not sign up for Obamacare uh, and, and would cause an increase in cost to the risk of the risk pool in the following years. Uh, you responded that your research, this is a quote, research shows that most people want health care, want health care, and the barrier has been the cost, and that you are looking forward to people, including young people, enrolling in coverage. With the latest figures showing that young people are enrolling at a much lower rate than you had originally anticipated, are you now worried, are you still worried that premiums will increase next year, that it's not just the natural tendency for young people, indeed for all of us, to procrastinate, that there are some other concerns such as maybe these overwhelming number of mandates with, which we knew 10 years ago we're driving up the cost of health care insurance in the individual states, probably all 50 states, including mine of Georgia. Uh, we knew these age banding rules that were put in Obamacare, uh, rather than, say, five to one uh, maximum premium increase for older people compared to, to younger, is now three to one. 
uh, community ratings, and uh, you know, there these things are there, and and I, I'm I'm real concerned. Are you? Do you continue to be concerned about that? Well, we certainly, uh, you know, want to do everything we can to encourage, uh, you know, all Americans and and in particular young Americans to get health care. I think it's important to keep in mind that the risk pool is not just the risk pool in the marketplaces. The risk pool is in the entire market. And so when you have, say, 3 million uh, young people who have been able to get health coverage on their parents' plans, those are not necessarily in the marketplace, but those are three million uh, young Americans who didn't have insurance before who do have insurance and are part of the risk pool. I also would just point to a recent study by the Kaiser Family Foundation which actually said that uh, uh, a reduction in the percentage of, of people, uh, uh, young people who, who come into the, to the risk pool uh, will uh, is really will have an impact on health care premiums that's pretty modest. Yeah, so, that, of course, some of that's anecdotal. I understand what you're saying. But let me let me move to my next question. Uh, you know, I, I am concerned. I've heard that that navigators are actually going door to door. And this came up last time, too. Uh, and you said that navigators would not be going door to door. Uh, they are. Uh, and if you recall, during that same hearing, you told us, this subcommittee, that, that you would be, quote, issuing instructions to navigators that they should not be going door to door. Uh, did you issue these instructions? Yes, we have. And if, if you're aware of, of instances where navigators who are, who are, you know, our grantees are going door to door, we certainly want to hear about those. Well, well I thank you, because I am aware. And I would like to ask staff to uh, put up a, a brief uh, clip, uh, a video right now, in regard to that, since you asked me to show you some evidence. And we're just doing outreach and enrollment um, for the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. Do you currently have health insurance? Cam Nguyen is a navigator hired by taxpayer dollars to help people enroll in one of the new health insurance plans. Her grant came through the nonprofit Southern United Neighborhoods in New Orleans. She canvasses neighborhoods, goes to churches, uh, okay, that, and communities. Okay, that's, that's good. You can cut. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Cohen. What do you say to that? I had not seen that before, and we'll 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 look into it. And thank you for calling it to our attention. Well, I I hope you will look into it. I mean, you know, I my, some of my colleagues I uh, were very strong in saying uh, that that you you should be fired. That you, uh, I I don't know. My dad told me one time when I was in college, and my grades came in, and they weren't so good, and and I said, Dad, I'm doing I'm doing the best I can. And he said, son, unfortunately, your best just isn't good enough. Uh, I'm not calling for you to be fired, but, you know, we're concerned. I mean, you've got a big job. You've got a huge responsibility. And you know that. We know that. And, uh, you know, back to the drawing board, but you've got to do better. You Absolutely. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. And Checking to see who's next. Mr. Yarmuth, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Slide. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cohen, welcome back. Uh, and it's good to see you again. Uh, I w I'd like to start off by uh, getting something clarified for the record. Uh, this relates to Ms. Blackburn's questioning. What, it's my recollection that the, what the President said was that uh, after the Affordable Care Act were implement, was implemented, that insurance premiums, people would save $2,400 a year. Uh, opposed to what they would have been spending compared to what they would have been spending if it weren't for the passage of the Affordable Care Act. Is that your recollection of what he had said? That's my understanding of, of what he said, yes. Not that, people, not that people's insurance would cost $2,400 less. That, that's, that's my understanding, correct. And in fact, as, as has been alluded to earlier in the various questioning, health care costs are rising at a much lower rate than they have historically. So uh, while the numbers may not be precise. There's evidence to suggest that the president was actually correct in that insurance would have cost more if it weren't for the Affordable Care Act. I think there's no question about that, and I think it's also true that many Americans are seeing actual reductions in what they're paying over what they were paying. Not every American, but many Americans are. Right. Uh, let's talk about the enrollment history because, uh, first of all, it gives me an opportunity to boast about my state, uh, Kentucky, which has widely recognized as having had one of the most successful rollouts of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, currently, the numbers are we've had uh, in a state of 4.4 million people, 778,000 visitors to uh, connect our website, 123,000 
plus have enrolled uh, in either Medicaid or private plans. Uh, 300 and, uh, I'm sorry, 559,000 Kentuckians have been screened to determine whether they were eligible for either Medicaid or subsidies under private insurance, and many of those have not yet selected their plan, even though they have been uh, told that they qualify for private insurance. And 1,283 small businesses, this is as of January 2nd, have uh, gone started the process to enroll their employees as well. Um, so we're talking about already having insured about 20 percent or more of our entire uninsured population in just over half the, uh, this, well, this would have been exactly half the enrollment period. Um, and by the way, 40 percent of those are under 35. So in terms of Kentucky's experience, um, I think there's reason to be, as you said, optimistic that going forward we will have adequate numbers of young people in the, in the risk pools and uh, we shouldn't be too concerned yet about that. Uh, but a, s a couple weeks ago, there was, a, in one of the major national media, there was a chart that actually broke down the enrollments uh, according to three categories of states. They had the 14 states in the District of Columbia, which had both expanded Medicaid and set up their own exchanges, states that have expanded Medicaid but were using the federal exchange, and then states that had uh, not expanded Medicaid. And while I didn't do the math, uh, it was pretty clear that at least two-thirds and maybe even 75 percent of all the enrollments, the six million or so enrollments, were in those 14 states plus the district where there was concerted government support for the program. Um, so I'd, li I'd like you to comment on that and whether you're seeing that the, the degree of enrollment uh, seems to be correlated to the degree of support at the state and local level for the program. Uh, I think that's absolutely right, and it's true for many reasons. Uh, Kentucky's a great example where Governor Bashir has been just a, a, a stalwart advocate for uh, health care reform and for the Kentucky marketplace and getting it going. Uh, I think that contributes to uh, the success that those states have had in terms of developing their their marketplace and their IT systems. Um, if the if the uh, administration in the state is solidly behind that, it helps. It has, certainly helps with the outreach. It helps with the you know sending out positive messages to people and to the community of how important this is and what a great benefit this is for people. So I think there's no question. Now we saw a video there of, of navigators going door to door. There's another side of that coin as well, <clears throat> and I, I know I've talked to some people, for instance, in Florida where they've actually been handing out flyers discouraging people from signing up. Um, have you seen much evidence that there is a concerted effort to actually discourage people from uh, exploring their options under the exchanges? You know, I've heard some of that. I wouldn't be able to say how extensive it is. I think, obviously, it's very unfortunate that anybody would try to discourage people from taking advantage of an opportunity to get health care. Uh, just the last question, is there any effort in your uh, organization to try and find out or get evidence as to whether that's happening or not because that would I think be of interest to us. I, I don't know that we're investigating that within Sasayo, no. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Do you now recognize Mr. Olson for five minutes? I thank the chair and welcome Mr. Cohen. I hope you had an enjoyable holiday season like I did with my family. Thank you. My first question about a thing called the federally facilitated exchange user fee. Are you familiar with that fee, sir? Yes. Okay, so as you know, that's a fee that's imposed upon states, well, the, the providers the, that have not chosen to be, create their own health care plan, have chosen to be in the federal health care plan, like my home state of Texas. And is that required under law, under the Affordable Care Act, that fee? Um, I, I think it's authorized by the law. And okay. we, set the, we set the fee uh, yeah. on, in, on insurance companies based on the premium that they uh, get in the market. Would surprise that HSS rule in November of 2012 authorized that fee, created that fee? Yes, we issued a rule that, that, that created, that implemented that provision. Is it 3.5 percent? Yes. Is administration fully using that fee? I mean, do the plans and states have to cover some slack? I don't, I don't believe that, that the amount of that fee will fully cover the cost of operating the federally facilitated marketplace. I, think, I don't think it's going to be enough to pay all of the costs of running the, the, the marketplace. So you are tapping the resources of the private sector, the states, to pay the shortfall from this fee. It's not getting the job done, correct? No, no. I, we're tapping resources from within you know, our budget, 
but the fee is the fee. Okay, and the fee is authorized for one year. Do you expect to extend it next year? Yes, I expect there will be a fee next year. Okay, my second line of questions are about the navigators. And as you know, that video from my colleague, Mr. Green, was pretty damning. I mean, you recall when I asked you in here September 19th about the navigators hearing rumors back home in Texas that they were having voter registration cards going door to door. And you said, and this is a quote about the navigators, we will be issuing instructions to navigators that they should not be going door to door, end quote. My question is, you know, this is serious. Have you issued those instructions, yes or no? Yes. Can we get a copy of those instructions? I'm sorry. May we get a copy of those instructions? Sure. So we can see them. Sure, I can go back and tell you how we communicated that. I know we have, we have uh, regular communications with the navigators, and we put out that information to them, that that was something that they, that they were not supposed to go door to door to enroll people. They could, they could drop off information, but they were not supposed to go to door to door to enroll people. And you've heard stories from New York and Florida and New York Times that people, all the fraud that's been coming out with these navigators, what have you done the agency to address these fraud cases to make sure fraud doesn't happen? Because it's a big window of opportunity for people who want to do harm. Uh, any situation that we've learned about that involves any misconduct by uh, a navigator, we have uh, responded to. We have, uh, uh, we, in including requiring individuals that were involved to be dismissed uh, and not to serve as navigators, and, we, and including uh, issuing corrective action uh, uh, plans to any navigator organizations that uh, if we feel that they're not supervising their uh, employees adequately. One final line of question is about the disastrous rollout of Obamacare and what continue, the problems that continue. Uh, delays and misinformation happen and are happening today all over America. For example, I got enrolled in the exchange here, the D.C. public, the little small business exchange, my staff as well. My wife called up last week trying to make sure one doctor we like, we could keep this doctor, a specialist. It took her 30 minutes to talk to somebody on the phone, and they were asked, she was asked to read her new information. She got a new care for his card up there, read it proudly, and they said, we have no record of that. So she had to get the old card and work through this agency to be confirmed that, yes, we could keep that doctor on our plan. And so my question is, given this disastrous rollout and the continued problems have you ever been part of a conversation or a debate or discussion about delaying the launch or putting a hold on it with all these problems? Any, any discussion of that? Ever been part of that? No. No. Okay. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Green, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, welcome back, Mr. Cohen. Um, I was shocked to see the news report in New Orleans because in Houston, uh, our navigators do not go out and go door to door. Uh, we do have nonprofits that are not federal funded who are going in, and I'm encouraging them to come into our district uh, to go out and let folks know they have this ability to do it. But uh, the federal navigators we have, and now they do, they will come out to someone's house, but it'll be at a request or it'll be because, hey, I need somebody to help with the family or something. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad you're going to investigate that happening because I want navigators actually helping people do the paperwork or, in the case, filling out the, the, uh, the effort. The, um, as one who supported the Affordable Care Act and continue, that we, need the, we need the law, and I'd love our committee to be able to work on it and fix some of the flaws that we have in it that we've discovered. Um, but I'm pleased with the, uh, the enrollment increases in the last few weeks. Um, HHS re received, released them earlier this week, and we know that nearly 2.2 million have signed up for the private insurance plans through the federal and the state marketplaces as of December 28th. Four million more were signed up for Medicaid, and let's not forget that three million adults under 26 are still being able to get insurance through their, their parents. Do these enrollment estimates sound accurate to you? Oh, yes. Received? Oh, yes. I'm sure. I mean, they're as accurate as, as we can make them. <laughs> the, um, they're not as much as we would like, and I know the administration, uh, but I have a memo from our Democratic staff on our committee that, uh, that puts these numbers in context. Enrollment in the Affordable Care Act exchanges is ahead of the Part D enrollment at a similar time in 2006. Republicans then called Part D a success. Now they insist the Affordable Care Act's a failure. Uh, we still have a lot more work to do in other months ahead. 
but there is a doubt that a lot of people are finding, there is no doubt that a lot of people are finding access to quality, affordable health care. And I, I hope my Republican colleagues will, will sit down and work on legislation that will fix some of the problems we have, because nothing Congress ever passes is perfect, and we know that, and particularly with this. And, and instead of, you know, just throwing rotten apples, uh, maybe they should look back on what happened in 2003 when we passed the prescription drug plan that I didn't vote for. But I was also helping my seniors sign up for it and, and uh, encouraging people to do it. Even though I thought the law was flawed in 2003, some of it's been fixed by Affordable Care Act. But it, but it has, you know, we want to make sure those folks get it. And that's what amazes me. Mr. Cohen, based on Massachusetts' experience with implementing health reform, would you expect enrollment numbers to look like over the next few months? You know, I think we're very encouraged by what we saw in December. I think we're encouraged uh, by the tremendous interest that there remains uh, in the plan. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, Americans are now very much aware of uh, healthcare.gov uh, uh, as a result of what's happened over the last few months. Uh, and um, I think everyone um, expects that as we move toward the, you know, we still have, you know, uh, uh, two and a half months left uh, to the open enrollment period. And I think everyone expects as we get towards the end of uh, March, when it's the real deadline, uh, we'll see another uh, real uh, uh, uptick in the number of people enrolling. And if that happens, I think we'll have some very good uh, total enrollment numbers by the end of the period. Well, we know that uh, in the federal exchange, seven times as people signed up in December as did in October and November. Frankly, part of it is because of the website. And a lot of us have concern because that website was down. We did an event in Houston in the middle of November, and we actually had about 800 paper applications. And we had plenty of applications. I know there was an issue. We had paper applications both in Spanish and English that were used. But that's not the way we can get to the numbers we need. The website has to work. Um, finally, uh, can you talk about outreach plans the administration has in place to ensure that as many people as possible, learn about the uh, sign up for the new health coverage during the remainder of the enrollment period. Uh, I think we'll be seeing uh, significantly more paid media. I know there's a plan, uh, as I mentioned, to advertise uh, during the Olympics and other events uh, uh, that are particularly geared toward you know younger people, sporting events, and those kinds of things. I know the social media activities are are very much picking up, uh, and I think from what I'm hearing. We're going to be seeing uh, very significant investment by the private health plans in marketing and advertising as well. Um, a number of them sort of held back because of the issues early on uh, uh, with the website. But now that they see the enrollments are coming through, uh, I think we'll see uh, significant um, uh, you know, investment on outreach on their part as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, now I recognize Mr. Griffith for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cohen, thank you for being here. Uh, in your responses to uh, Ms. Blackburn, you indicated that many Americans have better plans at a lower cost. Do you recall indicating that to her? Yes. Under oath, and in your sworn Yes, many Americans have better health in coverage than what they had before, and it's costing them less. I think I mentioned uh, at least one of them you know, in my uh, oral testimony. Yes, you did. You actually mentioned a couple, one of them from my district, and, and I understand that. Also, you would have to acknowledge, under oath, that many Americans have lesser coverage at a greater cost. Isn't that true? No, that's not what I said. What I said was... That isn't for, what you said. For I'm some, for yes or no? I'm asking you a question, under oath. I don't believe... You know that many Americans have lesser coverage under the Affordable Care Act at a greater cost than they had before. Isn't that true? No, I don't know that. You don't know that. Well, let me tell you, I received an email today from a constituent of mine uh, who I know very well. His premiums in March are going to triple, and his deductible is doubling. That's lesser coverage at a greater cost. So there's one. I will tell you that I have received numerous uh, communications from members of, of my district, people who live in my district, along those lines. And, yes, there are some winners but there are also many losers. And it shocks me that you cannot acknowledge that here today when you're testifying under oath in front of this committee. There are losers under Obamacare, aren't there? Can, can I answer? Well, it's a yes or no. You know that there are losers under Obamacare. Do you not? 
I, if I'm not allowed to answer, then the I'm answer is either yes, you know that there are losers, or no, you don't know that there are losers. It's a yes or no, sir. Would the gentleman yield? I will not yield. The, the witness is not being. I think you need to define losers. A loser is one who has to pay more for coverage that's lesser. And I just gave him an example, but he won't acknowledge that he knows of anybody in the United Do you know of anybody in the United States in that circumstance, sir? I'm sure yes there, or no? I'm sure there is anybody in the United States in that circumstance, yes. And do you acknowledge that you have, just as you read the reports on other people who have had some successes who are winners under this, you've also read reports in the media of people who are losers under Obamacare, have you not? The problem that I have, Congressman, is that I don't know w what the – all of the options that might be available to that person. So uh, it's difficult for me to answer in le without knowing the full situation of what might be available to that person. But I understand that there are people who had coverage and uh, received a notification from their insurance company that they were being put to a different plan that cost more. I, absolutely, that's happened. There's and no you question. have reason to believe that those people are paying more that, and that's receiving happened. a lesser coverage. Well, I don't, but I don't know the details of what their plan, the plan is that they were in, what the details of the plan is that they were being offered, and I don't know the details of what other plans might be available to them that, that might enable them to avoid that situation. So I think it, it's a little bit more complex than you're presenting it to me, and you're not – that's all. Well – and That's I would all. submit that it's more complex on, on all of these situations because we have a 2,000-some uh, some page bill that's very hard for people to, to uh, get their arms around, and it's very hard for this administration, apparently, to operate and to run. That being said, let's talk about the shop exchanges for small businesses. Uh, those, that is another part of the plan that has been delayed for a year. Is that correct? Uh, the online capability for shop was, has, is delayed for a year, yes. And, um, you know, many of the other delays were for – for a few weeks or months, uh, why was this program delayed for a year? Uh, given everything that we needed to do to get the, the uh, uh, system working well for people in the individual market, uh, we made a decision that in terms of allocation of resources, we couldn't get the shop uh, online functionality built in time uh, for, for this year. And so we are relying on the traditional agents and brokers uh, uh, who, who historically have always been the way that uh, small It was a complicated outcomes. situation that you had your hard, hard time getting your arms around, and maybe if you sat down and learned all the aspects of it, you could advise on No, that. We, we had to make a choice. We had to decide what, what to devote our resources to. I was being sarcastic. To. I, I know you were. <laughs> uh, here's my problem, and this happens so often with this. The delay was announced uh, the day before Thanksgiving, wasn't it? I, I believe you. I, I don't okay. remember, but I believe you. Do, you. do you know if there were conversations before that day before Thanksgiving announcement? Uh, how I'm, long in advance was the decision made to delay the shop plan? I, I'm sure that there were conversations before it was announced. I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly, you know, when, but I know that into November there were conversations, and then when the, you know, a decision was made, and then it was announced. You know, there's a great concern uh, for a lot of us that a lot of these announcements come. We've even made comments in other hearings that these announcements come at holidays so that people will be doing other things and won't pay attention to the fact that there's yet been another delay, another failure in the rollout of this program. Do you agree that that's not an appropriate way to run uh, the, the operation and that it really ought to be coming out when people can know what's going on instead of uh, during the holiday time when nobody's paying attention? Well, I would agree with you that it's very important that we put out accurate information so that people can understand what's happening with the program. Yes. General Time so I would now recognize Mr. Tonko for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Director Cohen, uh, for your testimony uh, once again before the subcommittee. Uh, I believe we should have civil discourse with you, and so I'll try to conduct myself accordingly. Uh, before I get to my questions, I just wanted to share with the committee an Obamacare success story that I recently received from a constituent. Brian from the uh, city of Schenectady wrote to me that he had been paying almost $360 per month for a plan with no dental or vision coverage. Through New York State's online exchange, he was able to get a comparable medical plan and also purchase dental coverage for $290 per month. As he described it to me, this is more coverage for less money. Brian was able to complete uh, the process in less than two hours, and because he makes only $11 per hour, the difference in premiums is having a huge impact on his budget. Brian is not alone. As of January 1, more than 20, 241,522 New Yorkers were now enrolled in quality, low-cost health insurance coverage through My Home State's Exchange. In addition, more than 6,500 young adults in my district now have health insurance through their parents' plan, 
and more than 12,100 seniors in the district received prescription drug discounts worth $16 million. 124,000 seniors in the district are now eligible for Medicare preventative services without paying any co-pays, co-insurance, or deductibles. I could go on and on, but the point is that the Affordable Care Act is here to stay, and it is providing an enormous benefit already to the people of the 20th Congressional District of New York, which I have the uh, good fortune of representing. It never ceases to amaze me how hard my Republican colleagues work to avoid acknowledging the benefits of ACA. I've never heard them admit that this law helps the millions of Americans with pre-existing conditions who can no longer be discriminated against. Mr. Cohen, can you s summarize for us some of the important new protections that are now in place under the Affordable Care Act? Well, certainly, thank you, Congressman. Absolutely, the, the issue of pre-existing conditions is, is, is a huge one. Uh, previously, uh, people could be uh, denied insurance altogether, uh, not be, even because they're sick, you know, at the time that they're applying, but because they had some condition in the past uh, that caused the uh, medical underwriters to say that they weren't a good risk. And then if they were offered insurance, uh, notwithstanding whatever that pre-existing condition might be, they could be charged uh, significantly more as a result of, of that. And one of the impacts of that, of course, was the fact that women were being charged, you know, substantially more than men because being a woman was deemed to be a pre-existing condition. So all of that uh, is gone. And then the, the last one I would mention that I think is very important is that in the past, people could find that if they did become seriously ill, um, their insurance would run out because they had either an annual limit of how much it would pay or a lifetime limit over how much it would pay. And they might be in the middle of, uh, you know, uh, uh, a course of treatment that was necessary to save their lives and find that all of a sudden uh, the insurance company stopped paying uh, and that they were responsible for those costs on their own. So, and that can't happen anymore. Thank you. Um, the stories of people signing up for coverage are would drive home how important these new provisions are. Um, and I know some stories have recently been posted. I read a story about Nick from Miami. He's 29 and was denied coverage last year because of a pre-existing condition. He was forced to enroll in a short-term catastrophic plan that cost him $280 a month and had a termination date. Because of the ACA, he now has better coverage with lower out-of-the-pocket costs and a guarantee that he won't be kicked off his coverage or denied because of a pre-existing condition. Um, now he's covered and he does not have to worry. There are more of these stories each and every day. Uh, Albert from Texas got covered for the first time in his life because of the ACA. He got a plan for only $23 per month. He said it's the right thing to do. You never know what could happen to you. Um, Mr. Cohen, have you heard other stories like these? Uh, yes, we're hearing stories like that all the time, uh, and we're seeing them, uh, you know, through social media. We're seeing people are, are sending us their stories, uh, uh, you know, on healthcare.gov. There's a place where you can, you know, provide your story, and um, and I must say, uh, you know, they're extremely heartening. And you know, what do they say to you about the importance of the Affordable Care Act? Uh, you know, the, the Affordable Care Act is literally going to be life-saving for uh, many, many, many Americans who without it would not have had the ability to, uh, to get the health care that they need, and it's going to be a financial uh, uh, lifesaver uh, for many Americans who uh, otherwise would have faced bankruptcy as a result of medical costs, which was the leading, cost, uh, leading cause of bankruptcy in the country uh, you know, prior to the ACA, and I think we're going to see that change dramatically. Well, I just wish our colleagues would just admit for even the briefest moment that this law is helping millions of people. Maybe then we could move forward and uh, have a national conversation about the Affordable Care Act and any additional improvements that might be required. So with that, I thank you, Director Cohen, and thank you for appearing before our committee. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Now go to Mr. Long of Missouri for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one person that uh, does not think this is a life-saving endeavor is Brenda from my district. And Brenda has been fighting a very rare form of cancer for the last seven years. And she leaves Springfield, Missouri to go down to Little Rock, Arkansas to seek treatment. She's in a high-risk pool. She was in a high-risk pool. When she found insurance, she found out that she could no longer go to Little Rock, Arkansas to seek treatment from this very specialized doctor that has literally kept her alive for the last seven years. They gave her three months to live when first diagnosed. She got active. She's mid-50s, late-50s. And back then she was early-50s, I guess. 
50 years old, and she decided it wasn't time to die, so she wanted to fight and get active and find a treatment for this. So she did, down in Little Rock, Arkansas. And she called me from her chemo chair, or texted me, emailed me from her chemo chair, telling me that she had lost her insurance. And when she found new insurance, because of the high-risk pools going away, when she found new insurance, she was told that she could no longer seek treatment down in Little Rock, Arkansas, from this doctor, who's one of the few in the country that does it. So I know you say it's life-saving. I know that my friend from New York says that uh, he wants people on this side of the aisle to ad admit there are good cases. Sure, sure, there's people that are picking up insurance. There's good cases, but there's also people that uh, this could very easily cost them their life. So I'm concerned for people like Brenda. Let's talk about those well, high risk. We certainly would like to hear from you about Brenda's situation, if there's anything we can do to work with the insurance companies. And I appreciate that. Okay. We, uh, We'd be very happy to do that. Yeah. Work. I gave a floor speech on the subject a month or so ago, whenever she first emailed me, and she was literally in the chemo chair in uh, Little Rock taking the treatment, and she said all the nurses stood up and cheered my floor speech in, in the room. And uh, but there are serious, serious concerns for people like Brenda. Sticking with the high-risk pools for just a minute, I know that uh, this new national high-risk pool, as opposed to the state-run ones that ran out the end of December or whatever, have been extended to the end of the what period? End of March. End of March. What, um, how are those being paid for? I mean, where are you getting the money to pay for those? Who's paying for that? We, we cannot get any answers. At least my staff has not been able to on how this is being funded. Can oh, you? well, that's very clear. I mean, there's a $5 billion appropriation in the Affordable Care Act, and that's the entire amount of money uh, is that $5 billion appropriation that was in the Affordable Care Act uh, that has paid for the PSIP program. Uh, and um, we had... Um, well, that was, wasn't that... I don't... I hate to interrupt you. I guess that's not my style, but the, okay. the uh, uh, $5 billion wasn't that for a set amount of time, but with these, ex we keep getting these extensions that don't seem to be paid for. So the statute says that we uh, can use that money uh, to uh, uh, ease the transition of PSIP enrollees into the new market. And so what we found was we had enough funding based on the number of enrollees we had and the costs that we're incurring uh, to allow uh, those um, benefits to continue through March. And as of at the end of March, by the end of March, Everyone who's in that program needs to get, uh, you know, private coverage, uh, and that program will or they won't be able to seek coverage in Little Rock. So that, that's the rub there, I think. But uh, my the uh, ranking member said earlier, and my friend from Florida made reference to the fact that there's all these people that have new coverage, all these people that have enrolled in the Affordable Care Act that didn't have coverage before. How can we drill down and figure out what that number is? Because just because 146,000 in Florida and Ms. Castro's district signed up in December, how, what's, how do we know that those people did not have insurance before? How do we know they're not like Brenda that was forced off her plan and hopefully can find another plan? Is there a way to ascertain if these are true numbers, if these are really people that are covered for the first time ever? They now have health care insurance that never had it before? So, so that's a really good question, and we're working on uh, being able to uh, provide data as to the number who were previously uninsured versus the number who may have been insured before and, and are switching to new coverage. And we understand that's an important issue. We don't have that data today, but we we'll Okay, if you, if you can work on that, getting, because it, it just, you know, one side tells one side of the story, one side tells the other, and usually, as you know, the truth lies in the middle. So when I hear how many people that never had coverage before, I question if they didn't have lost it and bought news. So thank you for your time here today. Thank you. The gentleman yields back now, Mr. Butterfield, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Cohen, for your testimony today. I want to assure you, Mr. Mr. Cohen, that when the history of this debate is written many years from now, uh, I promise uh, that you will be regarded as one of many people uh, in this administration and across this country who are on the right side and help millions of Americans get insurance. You are doing the right thing, and I want to thank you uh, for what you do. Thank you. Uh, but, Mr. Chairman, this is getting ridiculous. Uh, my friends just won't let go. I think Mr. Tonko made reference to it a few minutes ago. Uh, 
Uh, let me try to put this in somewhat uh, of context. Uh, yesterday's New York Times wrote that North Carolina Senator Kay Hagan has faced more than 3,500 negative ads about the Affordable Care Act since June the 1st. That amount of negative ads is more than three times as much as any other member of Congress. Five million dollars has already been spent on negative ads related to Obamacare in my state of North Carolina. The fact is, Mr. Chairman, the Affordable Care Act is the law of the land. It is working in my state. Uh, the Brenda in my district is named Carlton Stevens, Jr. Uh, I drove up to an Exxon station a few days ago, and little Carlton, we called him, jumped out of his car uh, and told me how excited he was that he had signed up with the Affordable Care Act, told me that he was paying $700 a month for he and his wife and two children, that the premium was going up to $800 that he enrolled in the Affordable Care Act and is now paying $240 per month. The fact is, and the reason Mr. Cohen uh, had difficulty in trying to describe winners and losers is that each case is unique. You have to compare the coverage. You have to compare the cost. You have to compare the circumstances. And so the Brenda in my district is Carlton Stevens, and he's getting insurance now for $240 per month. Of all states participating uh, in the federal exchange, my state, uh, Ms. Elmer's state as well, uh, had more than 107,000 enrollees from October to December, which constitutes the most enrollees in the federal marketplace per capita. 89% of those enrollees are low or middle income and qualify for a tax credit for their plans. North Carolinians are having tremendous success with the federal marketplace and healthcare.gov. Uh, in fact, North Carolina leads all of the states in health and human services region four with more than 61% of individuals who complete an application selecting a marketplace plan. Nationwide, the trend is very similar. By the end of December, nearly 2.2 million had enrolled and several hundred thousand more have enrolled since then. Tuesday's Washington Post cover story stated, quote, the data show a sevenfold, sevenfold upswing in enrollment in the federal exchange from the first two months as the website's performance improved, uh, end of quote. And so, Mr. Cohen, I want to ask you, can you describe for me the trend in the number of adults, 18 to 34, who have selected these marketplace plans? I think we reported that the 18 to 34 uh, was about 24 percent of uh, of the enrollments, and that that was very close to the percentage of uh, that age group in the general population. So we were uh, were quite pleased by that, and we expect to see uh, you know the, that number increasing as we move through the rest of the open enrollment period. Well, talk to me about uh, some of the national campaigns which will help to begin to to get youth enrollment up higher than even 24 percent, so perhaps, I, perhaps to 40 percent. So I know that we are uh, going to be doing uh, a, a lot more paid media, specifically uh, around the Olympics, which will be starting in, in a couple of weeks, uh, and around uh, other, you know, uh, sporting events and other activities that we would expect uh, young people to be particularly interested in. I know we're doing, uh, have been doing, and are doing an increased amount of uh, outreach through the social media, you know, Facebook, Twitter, you know, um, all that sort of thing. Um, and I know that we are, all of our advertising is very targeted to try to uh, reach the populations that um, we, um, you know, most want to get in. Obviously, we want everyone to enroll, but we want to particularly focus, obviously, on the young people, as we've talked about. Thank you. Well, lastly, I, I made reference to, to my home state of North Carolina in my in introductory statement, and, and I'm very proud of the enrollment rates there. Uh, I have 700,000 people in my congressional district, and I tell you that 100,000 of those 700,000 is uninsured, uh, and this is making a difference. What, what, what factors do you believe uh, contribute to North Carolinians choosing marketplace plans at such a high rate as compared to the national norm? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I have to believe that in places uh, that where the, the need is the most, uh, you know, uh, is where we're seeing the biggest response. So in places where the, rel where the rate of uninsured was high, um, I think that's where we're seeing the, the biggest response. Thank you. 
In response to his question, do you know how much you're spending on the Olympics advertising? I, I actually don't, but I'm sure we can get that. Would you let, please let us know. Thank you. Now recognize the gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Elmers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I, uh, to my colleague uh, from North Carolina, uh, Mr. Butterfield, I, I'm going to kind of extend some of the questions uh, to you, Mr. Cohen, uh, where Mr. Butterfield left off. And adjoining districts, we might add. W yes. Adjoining districts. Um, you know, my colleague, you know, pointed out that about 107,000 um, uh, have, have enrolled in North Carolina. That's the figures that we're seeing. However, 473,000 received cancellation notices for their health care policies that they already had. So even though that 107,000 may sound impressive, we are way behind on those who have been, had their, had their policies canceled. So there's a lot of making up to do. I do want to get back to some of those, those numbers. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, how many people in America do you believe have signed up for coverage now? Well, the most recent figures that we uh, put out uh, were 2.2 million, and that's just in the marketplace. Obviously, okay. there are people so who are buying coverage. So the 6 million there figure that I keep hearing today, where is the 6 million figure coming from? Uh, that's taking the 2.2 and adding 3.9 million who uh, enrolled in Medicaid. Okay. So... When we, so, so basically what we're doing is we're culminating. And are you aware that the Washington Post gave um, three Pinocchios to this number? Um, are you going to keep this figure? I, I didn't see the Pinocchios. I'd have to take a look at what they called into question. So you agree with the $6 million, the six million figure? The, you, you, you believe that there have been $6 million. I believe that, that as we reported, 2.2 million uh, have enrolled in marketplace plans and about 3.9 million uh, had enrolled in Medicaid. And I think the Medicaid number was actually only through November. Okay. Now, of those who signed up for Medicaid, how many of them could have previously signed up for Medicaid but did not before Obamacare was instituted? I don't have that number for you. You I don't think. have the number. Can you get the number? Um, I can certainly ask my colleagues in Medicaid if, if they have that number. Okay, I, I, that, don't, I don't run Medicaid, so... Uh, that doesn't fall under you? No. Um, okay, well. Um, so now we have a situation where we have a number of Medicaid that signed up. Wonderful. We want to make sure that people have coverage that, you know, that, that is applicable to them. But isn't this going to play into the cost factor, especially for those states? You know, when we, when we don't really know where the numbers fall out as far as um, which those who could have signed up before but did not for whatever reason and now have? Well, the, for it, it, the, 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 states, the, the, the states that expand, uh, the newly eligible will be paid, you know, 100 percent by the Right, the government. newly eligible. The new but those who could have been, received coverage before, the states are going to be responsible for a percentage of that, correct? That's right, under the usual match, yes. Okay. Now, um, you said you don't have the number, you don't have the figure. Um, when we had Secretary Kathleen Sebelius, she said that she did not have that number, and I believe she actually said that they could not get that number. So I would appreciate... Hmm if you could get that to us in the committee, because that, I think, I think the thing of it is, and, and I'll just quote the, the Washington Post fact checker, basically what, what he said is this number tells you almost nothing about how the health care law is affecting Medicaid enrollment. Reporters need to stop using it, because basically, and that's a quote, mm -hmm. um, because it, it's very misleading. It's very misleading. Now, I, I do want to get back. I've got a little bit more time here. You know, we're all sharing stories about our constituents, and, you know, some of the stories that we've heard have been positive. I want to hit on the, the issue um, of, of the change for women, uh, because I keep hearing about the issue about, you know, bringing down costs for women. However, I have a woman uh, who was formerly in my district, is not in my district now, from Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, who basically reached out to my office and through, you know, personal situation, lost her health care coverage. Um, and now the plan, she was paying $254 a month. Now she's going to have to pay $610 a month. She simply cannot afford it. She's probably going to have to choose to not take coverage. How, when we continue to claim that, that, that health care has improved for women with, you know, um, mammograms, when we call these things free, how did we go from $254 a month to $610 a month and we can still claim that she's getting free services? So I, 
again, I really can't address an individual situation without knowing more of the specifics. Would be happy to, to you know, have have folks talk to her if, if she is interested. Well, I, I, would, I would appreciate that. I will have uh, my staff get that information to you and your office so that we can work. Because if we are really going to take care of women in this country, health care issues for women, let's be straight on it. Let's make sure that we are getting the points across because women's health is very, very important. And this is very misleading. And so with that, I, I yield the remainder of my time. Only yields back. Now recognize Ms. Schakowsky for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to talk a little bit about constituent service when it comes to health care. Because long before the Affordable Care Act, my office spent a lot of time dealing with insurance problems. Um, people who suddenly weren't able to get the medication that they had been getting before. Um, I mean, really tricky issues that sometimes we could solve and sometimes we couldn't solve. So the private insurance market, um, as it was before, was very difficult to navigate. I think that's really important to remember. But I have to tell you, Mr. Cohn, we have done constituent service with your office on many occasions now since the Affordable Care Act is in place. And I'm happy that you were able to um, tell my friend, Mr. Uh, Congressman Long, that you would look at the Brenda situation and work to get her the um, health care that she needs. And I would suggest that um, my experience has been that we have been able to resolve through your office many of the problems. Yes, this is a confusing time, but I guarantee you that before the, uh, Obamacare, it was very confusing every year. And by the way, still is with Medicare Part D. And we you know, really encourage all of our constituents on that program to look every single year to make sure that their m medications are still on the formulary. And if I can just say, Congresswoman, you know, we have uh, gotten tremendous response from the insurance industry, from the pharmaceutical industry, as we've tried to resolve these problems this January. And I have talked with the issuers, I've talked with the, with the pharmacies, I've talked with the hospital association, and what I'm hearing from them is that the nature of the problems that we're seeing as we moved into January and people using their coverage are no different from what has happened every year uh, as people get new coverage, change coverage. There are always issues in terms of, you know, people being able to verify their enrollment, being able to see their doctor, all those kinds of issues. And we stand ready to help. We have caseworkers in every single region of the country, and we stand ready to help anybody uh, if we possibly can. And I know that in um, my state, Democrats and Republicans are working very hard to help their constituents, and so I'm hoping that everyone on the other side of the aisle on this committee is taking advantage of the constituent service that's available from you, and then also through the insurance companies and the pharmace pharma pharmaceutical companies. I, I wanted to, again, go over a little bit on the issue of these letters of termination. Um, Insurance companies that we've talked to said they expected almost all of their current customers to stay covered. Have you seen evidence of that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, in, in, and so it, it really is not accurate to think that because a plan was, uh, is no longer being offered that that means the person's not getting coverage. And, and let's again, be clear, it's not offered because it doesn't meet the, uh, the, the criteria of the tent that's the right and so covered. so in every instance that I'm aware of the carrier offered the uh, the the person a new plan uh, that that and in some cases automatically enrolled them in a new plan uh, so that there would be no gap in coverage uh, so um, and then in addition to that of course we've we've through our transitional policy we've made it possible for for people uh, to keep uh, their existing plan um, if that's what the insurance company um, uh, wants to offer to them. My understanding of this issue, issue of the grandfather option enables about half of those who receive cancellation notices to renew their plan. Is that, has this been happening? Th that's right. Um, and roughly half the remaining group that got cancellation letters, my understanding is, are able to get actually a better deal through the federal and state marketplaces because they're eligible for tax credits or Medicaid, so they get better coverage for a lower and often 
much lower cost. So for people who are eligible for the subsidy, uh, absolutely we would expect that they would pay less and they would in many cases get m better benefits than what they had had. And finally, um, in December, the, the president announced that individuals who had canceled policies would be eligible for a hardship exem exemption so they could purchase a low-cost catastrophic plan. Um, how will this change the options available to those that got canceled? So w what that basically means is anyone who got a cancellation and f feels that the plans that are available to them uh, are not affordable can uh, 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 claim the hardship exemption and can enroll in the catastrophic plan, which is a high deductible plan, but will cover them in the case of any serious illness. Uh, and those plans are generally very affordable. Thank you. I yield back. Chair recognize Mr. Johnson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cohen, I too uh, would like to thank you for being here today. Um, you know, we, we've had a long and arduous journey since, uh, uh, since this all started and, and the American people came under the, the Affordable Care Act back last October, the website going up. You mentioned in your testimony uh, that, uh, um, you know, the problems that we had, that it wasn't time to give up, it was time to roll up our sleeves and, and get to work. Well, I, I respect that, but, but I'll submit to you that we've got a little bit of a different idea about what roll up your sleeves mean. Um, you see, uh, the American people, uh, businesses, individuals, hardworking taxpayers across this country who are increasingly burdened by the big spending, over-regulating policies of this administration, not very many of those folks get a second chance. Only in Washington, D.C. and with this administration do we see a, a constant pattern of redo at somebody else's expense. In this case, it's the American people's expense. So I submit to you that what we should have done, what the administration should have done, is roll up its sleeves and do this the right way in the first place. Let doctors and patients manage their health care. We've got a private sector health, uh, health care uh, system that has provided the best health care in the world. Uh, it did not have to be done this way. Well, let me get to a few uh, specific questions. Um, since the launch of healthcare.gov, Mr. Cohen, has the site been subject to any security breaches? No. No security breaches? There have been no uh, breaches in the sense of anybody attacking the, the site and, and being able to There have to been no it. incidences of people attacking? No, that where they were successful. That's what you just said. Where they, no, well, because you interrupt me, Congressman, I don't get a chance to finish what I'm trying to say. No, there have been no successful attempts of where anyone has been able to attack the system and penetrate it. Wow, that is, that is contrary to what we've heard in other testimony and what is widely known uh, in, in the media. Mr. What, Chairman, I respectfully what, disagree uh, with that. Claiming my time, claiming my time, what, uh, uh, what is the difference in your opinion between a security incident and a security breach? You could have a security incident where uh, because of an error or a mistake or somebody sent something to the wrong place or, you know, that, you, that was an isolated specific incident where, where information was transmitted in a way that was incorrect. A breach, well, how do you, I, when I hear how do you breach. you relate that back to the testimony that we've heard before, uh, before the Energy and Commerce Committee that security was never even factored in uh, and tested prior to standing up the website? So uh, uh, can you promise the American people today, right now, that their personal information is secure on website.gov? Yes. I can't okay. promise that there won't ever be an incident, but I can promise that their information is secure, and I can promise that, that all That sounds like an oxymoron to me. You can't, you can't assure that there's not going to be a, a breach, but their information is secure. That's and not what I said. Let me ask you a follow-on question. Can you promise to this Congress that if healthcare.gov is subject to a breach or a hack or any security failure, that you'll alert the Congress as soon as you find out about we, it? We follow uh, uh, normal procedures and protocols for uh, when those incidents happen. But, but the American people need to know and this Congress needs to know, so can we get your uh, 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 agreement that you'll we'll, notify Congress we'll, if that occurs? We'll certainly work with you to make sure you get that information. Okay. I, who, whose job is it to inform Congress and the American people when a security breach occurs? 
Whose uh, job is that? CMS has an office of security, you know, information security that's responsible okay. for that. Uh, and, and is today, in, in the case of the Medicare system where we have 50 billion uh, who is, 50 million enrollees that we, uh, whose data we I got have. it. CMS is responsible. Who is responsible for the overall cybersecurity of the healthcare.gov site? Um, I think that's the same. Do you know how many people in uh, CMS uh, are dedicated to protecting the security of healthcare.gov? I couldn't tell you a number of people. I know we have a dedicated security team. I know we do continuous monitoring. We actually have people watching the site 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Do you know how many contractors are involved? Do you know how many contractors are involved? I don't. Do you know how much money? Do you know how much money is being spent to uh, provide on security? security? Um, no. I would have to get that number for you. Does anyone report to you regarding the security of of the site? Um, my office is not responsible for the security of the site, but I am given reports on. Anything. Okay. Can you uh, can you give us examples of those reports so we can see what those reports include? I can certainly take that request back and see what we have. Okay. Well, I mean, they come to you, so you ought to be able to release them, right? Uh, I can certainly take your request back and see what we have. Okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Chairman, I, I ask. Uh, I just, I, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that uh, there, a number of the reports on attempts to hack in the system are classified, and uh, we, well, can, we've make, we can make that available to all members to know that there have been multiple attempts. There's not been a breach yet, but I'm sure the attempts will continue on, but uh, much of that is classified. So, I have Mr. Chairman, um, on, that, on that vein, um, last week, Democratic staff of the subcommittee and full committee prepared a memo uh, of information that was provided in the classified briefings, which is not classified. The a lot of the information, I was at the classified briefings. A lot of that information was not of a classified nature. And so, um, and what, what that information said is there are no successful hacks of healthcare.gov. And it further said that there have, that surprisingly there have been no um, additional attempts than other government websites. And so I would ask unanimous consent to put that memorandum, which is dated January 9, 2014, into the record. And we'll take that in the record. We will also remain vigilant because we suspect there will continue to be Absolutely. attempts. Now, uh, there is uh, some time left on the floor for votes. Uh, ask members, we can adjourn to go vote and come back and complete this. Um, I think we have time. Would you like to continue? Who's next? Uh, Mr. Harper, you're recognized for five minutes. And uh, thank you, Mr. Cohen. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, we're almost done. Uh, I'd like to ask a few questions if I could. You touched on earlier in response to some questions about uh, risk corridors. Okay. And, uh, you know, one, uh, you know, it's, it's a program to offset huge uh, cost increases, it being the temporary risk corridor program. Where within the administration is this program housed? Is it HHS, CMS, or where? The risk corridors is under, under my program. Okay. And the individual in charge of that program would be who? The person who works for me who is responsible for that program's name is Sharon Arnold. So is it just uh, that one person then that would be the one in, in charge? Well, of she, she runs the program. Oversee. She reports to me. Okay. Um, so... I'm, uh, I'm responsible, but she works for me, and that's her program that she's managing thank with, you. with other people, with her staff. And there are other staff, then, multiple people would ha help her to, to run that program. That's true. And would you be uh, able to provide us a, a complete list of the staffers who do uh, perform any service connected to the risk uh, corridor program? Yes. Thank you. Under this program, if insurers are hit with costs greater than 103% of their premiums, the government will give them money. Is, am I correct? That's right. How uh, will... With, then there's certain... It's sure. a little more complicated than that, but, but yes. And, and I've, I've got a couple of follow-up questions that may allow you to, to answer that. How will the determination be made of what these costs are? I, I mean, is there a form or... How the the, the insurance insurers? companies will have to present... Uh, uh, data to us on their health care expenditures um, and, and, at, at the, and, and then it, it won't be until 2015 that we actually make any payments under the program. So can you tell us uh, exactly how the insurers will report this? I know it has to be, they're, they're going to report it, but how are they going to report there, it? There, there will be a, uh, you know, forms or templates or whatever to, that they will have to provide to us the accounting information that will tell us what their health care spending has been. Okay, and, and I've got follow-up, too, on some enrollment questions, if I can kind of shift over to that. Sure. 
Uh, the most important number, as has been reported by many uh, news outlets, is whether individuals have paid. Does the administration collect this information? I'm just asking, do, they, do you collect this information? Right now, we're not, but we will be. When? As soon as that functionality is built. I think I answered some questions about that earlier, that not all of that functionality is will, built yet. Will that mean then that we have to go back, all those who are enrolled, find out whether or not they've paid, so there, we'll have to go back to those who are already in? We're not collecting it as it occurs? We, we ultimately will reconcile to make sure that the advanced premium tax credits, for example, are not paid uh, with respect to anyone who didn't pay their premium, because that's a requirement that you pay your premium in order to get the, the what, tax credit. What, 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 department, what department would have this data? It's going to come to my, to my office, to my, so my, my agency. Who, who would be the individual that would be in charge of that That's operation? also Sharon Arnold. How many, so we don't know at this point how many people have actually paid for coverage. That's right. So are you telling me that you don't have any data, you haven't received any information as to who's paid, or you just haven't compiled We've, it yet? We, we have gotten enrollment data from the issuers with respect to the APTC payments that we're going to be making next week. But it's not on the it's not on an individual basis, um, so they they've told us who the, the number of people who are enrolled and, and who have paid, but we don't have it on an individual basis. Which am, ultimately, am I, ultimately, we will. And, and I didn't mean to cut you off, Mr. No, Cohen. Uh, are you telling me you're going to be paying insurers without knowing whether or not the insureds have been paid? No, we're going to be relying on data from them as to who has paid, but we don't yet have an an automated okay. system. So if you're relying that data, on that, and we data. will reconcile. We will reconcile that as soon as the, you know, make sure that. The, those numbers are, are, are reconciled and are correct once we do have the capability of receiving the additional. All right. Well, do you know the total amount of paid from each insurer at this point? Since you're relying on that data, we have we that. have info yes we have information on what we're going to be paying to each can insurer we, in this first group of payments that's going out next week. We do have that. Can we go ahead and get the data that you do have, whether it's compiled or not? Uh, I'm sure you can. Okay. All right. I believe my time's almost expired. I'll yield back. Jimmy Owens back now. Recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Gardner, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Cohen, for your time today. Um, I, too, received my insurance cancellation. Have you ever met anybody who had their insurance canceled? Uh, you may be the first. That's pretty shocking because 335,000 people in Colorado alone had their insurance canceled. Um, the letter that I got that told me that it would be canceled included this option. Your option includes purchasing another individual health plan from us, purchasing a health plan from another carrier, or purchasing a new plan through Connect for Health Colorado. Was the President's promise that I could keep my health care plan upheld? The President's promise to me, was that upheld? Well, I mean, we, we've talked about this a lot. The law provided that insurance companies could keep the existing plans uh, if, and as long as they didn't make significant changes to, uh, to benefits and, and cost sharing. Insurance companies made different choices. There are still a lot of grandfather plans out there, and those maintain. But then there were other plans that did not continue into 2014. So and, for, in some cases, those plans were canceled. And so was the president's promise upheld to me? I mean, I don't remember the president saying uh, there's qualifications if you like your health care plan. There's no asterisk. Well, there's the, no law, the, law made it the law made it possible for everyone who was in an existing plan as of the time it was passed for that plan to be maintained, but it didn't require insurance companies to continue offering them. So, the so, what, we did, so what we did in November was we uh, offered another opportunity to say to insurance companies, you can keep those plans uh, in place even if they didn't uh, – meet the requirements of the grandfathering provision. So these changes to allow that to, uh, these are big changes that you'd have to go, or five, would a $5 change require them uh, to discontinue the plan? Uh, it was a percentage change that was in the regulation as to how much, and it wasn't a change in premium, it was a change in benefits or cost sharing. Uh, so a copay of $5, that would require you to lose your insurance then? Um, I think that was one of the requirements. And so is that a significant change to an insurance policy, in your opinion? Well, if a copay was 20 and it goes up $5, that's pretty significant, yeah. So the president's promise, he should, so really in your mind, he shouldn't have even had to apologize because he didn't do anything wrong. I think the president said that it, he, he recognized that um, what he had said did not prove to be true um, for many Americans. And as a result of that, we offered another um, uh, uh, transitional policy to make it 
be more possible for more Americans. And to do you have do you have legal opinions that, that give the president the authority to make these extensions and changes? Could you provide me with the legal memorandums? That I'd have to go back. I, I honestly don't recall whether we had a Thank legal you. opinion on that. Um, when did you, you you testified in September, as we've talked about before the, the yep. committee, talking about everything going fine and it would be fine. When did you first know that it wasn't going fine? Was it September 27th, 28th, October 1st? October 1st. So you had no indication prior to October 1st that things weren't going well? I had no indication, but prior to October 1st, that we were going to have the you know, major, major uh, problems with the website that we ended up having. When did you first know that people would have their insurance canceled? Uh, I think we've always known that not all of the grandfathered plans were going to continue. Uh, I don't think we had a, a, a necessarily a sense of how many would and how many wouldn't. When do you expect uh, small business plans to start canceling insurance? Uh, that will likely happen throughout the course of the year. Uh, small business plans don't tend to all come uh, up for renewal in January. Many of them were renewed early in 2013 so that they will continue. And uh, how many do you anticipate being canceled? I don't have a number of that. I don't, I, we can look to see if we can come if up with a You could provide an estimation of how many additional insurers, insured, insured you'd think will be canceled. That would be great. Um, and so do we, we have an idea of how many signed up through the, the Federal Exchange so far? I know some of this we've talked about before, but how many people have signed up through the Federal Exchange? Well, we reported that as through, Janu through December 28th, it was 2.2 million in the Federal and the State, and of those, um, it was uh, a, something over 1, 1.1 million were in the Federal. Okay, so about 1.1 million in the Federal, 1.1 million in the States? Roughly, yeah. Okay. Um, how many of those who signed up in exchanges were not previously insured? And I don't have that number. How many were previously insured but uh, had their insurance canceled and now signed up in the federal exchange? And I don't know, have that number either. How many saw their insurance rates go up? I, I don't have that number. But you, you said that you know of a significant number of people who saw the rates go down. As we've been hearing, you know... Um, so you don't uh, know for sure if their rates went down. You're hearing anecdotal evidence. We're hearing anecdotally, and, and I think so that... So we don't have any I, concrete numbers on whether rates went up or down, for, I mean, well, as I, in the government? I, I, think, I think that we know that for people who are eligible for a subsidy, uh, that, um, you know, for, for those people, it is, you know, almost certain that their costs would have gone down. So you have some numbers, but you don't know how many went up. Okay. Um, so of the supposed $45 million without insurance... How many people now have insurance? I don't think we have that number yet, but certainly we're going to try to come up with as good data as we can as we go forward, um, you know, through so to the end of open. How moment. do we know the law is working? Well, we know the law is working for many people, and we know that... But you don't know how many of the uninsured are now insured. You don't know how many people saw the rates go up versus rates go down. Insurance companies aren't being paid yet. What's, let's talk about the risk corridor provisions. What is the probability of the risk corridor provision being utilized or activated? Utilized. What, what, is, what is the probability of the risk corridor language being utilized? Oh, I mean, I think there will be a risk corridor program. No, but I mean, what is the provision of that language being activated and payments being made from the government to insurance companies? What's the probability of that? Oh, it, it, that will happen. So you're saying that the government will be paying private insurance company. Oh, oh well, how likely fired. it is that there will be that, that there will be claims on the program? I, yes. um, I, I think we anticipate that there will be claims on the program, but there also may be some whose costs are lower than what they anticipated, and there will be payments into the program, and I think the estimate uh, was that it was budget neutral. Gentlemen, it's time to expire. Thank you. Dr. Bridges, do you have a follow-up question on something? I'm just going to give you 30 seconds as we'll have to go. Well, I know we'll have to, to do this for the record, Mr. Cohen. We're interested in uh, the, any legal memoranda that uh, you've been advised of or briefed on that define the authority under the Affordable Care Act to delay implementation or the authority to exercise enforcement discretion over enforcement provisions. We all know this law that was signed in March of 2010 bears no resemblance to what is actually going on today because of the variety of, of enforcement discretions and, and delays that have been implemented by the administration. We'd like to know under what legal authority you are operating or what you have seen that gives you the legal authority to do so. 
Thanks, Mr. Chairman. You'll, you'll provide that for the recommendation. We'll Warren. certainly take that request back and work with you. Uh, I also would like you to follow up with the other, other questions that members on both sides of the aisle asked uh, as follow-up questions. I'd uh, really like to know Mr. Gardner's uh, answers to his questions. He asked about just how many people of the 45 million that originally was supposed to help are signed up and if it's more or less expensive for them. Um, and I ask unanimous consent that the written opening statements of other members who wish uh, will be introduced to the records. And in conclusion, I'd like to thank all the witnesses, uh, the witness and members that participated in today's hearing and remind members they have 10 business days to submit questions to the record. And I ask Mr. Cohen if you would please agree to respond promptly to the questions. Uh, and with that, this uh, committee hearing is adjourned. <laughs>